So welcome everyone. Like Sydney said, my name is Liz and um, I am going to run you through basically just a little intro to meditation and I'll talk a little bit about what meditation is, what it isn't, um, how, when, why we do it. And then if everyone is willing, I'll take you through a short breathing exercise and then a guided meditation. So what I, what I just titled the presentation was meditation, finding peace and calm in the quiet. And, you know, I hope as we move through the workshop this evening, you gain a little bit more insight, a little bit more knowledge, and a little bit of experience into what meditation is. Because I think for some people, it's kind of like this, this um, concept that's a little bit out there um, and they really don't understand it. So just a little bit about my background. Um, usually I, I joke with patients like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do your injection today. I watched a YouTube video and I feel fully confident. But um, in all seriousness, I am a nurse full time. I'm also a, a registered yoga teacher and a meditation instructor. And holistic nursing is my background. So that's kind of um, a little snippet about me. Um, so whether or not anybody is aware, this coming Friday, the 20th, is actually World Meditation Day. And it's not necessarily a noted holiday, but more just an invitation for people to take part in meditation, to take a moment if they, if they have no experience meditating or they don't have access to um, a program that they can meditate with, it offers them an opportunity to just be still and be quiet in the moment. So when we talk about meditation, it's, it's funny because I think people have a lot of different ideas about what meditation is. One time I was uh, leading a meditation for uh, a group that I was doing and um, one of the women said to me, if, if you don't mind and, and no disrespect, but I really, I just don't want to participate in meditation because I don't want you to recruit me to your religion. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I was so close. I had the most recruits. I just needed one more. Come on, just join the meditation. Give me one more recruit and I can win the prize. And she was like, nope, actually not. So I said, okay. Um, she said, but I will sit in here and, and I'll observe. And I took them through just a short guided meditation. And at the end, she said, oh, that was totally not what I expected. I thought it was going to be something completely different. So I, you know, I, I think sometimes that's where a lot of hesitation comes from for uh, people. If you're not familiar with meditation or you've never experienced it, you've never even heard of it, um, it makes total sense why it would seem a little um, far off. But when we do talk about meditation, just a little compare and contrast. Meditation has been around for probably the better part of 5,000 years or more. And only lately, actually probably within the last 60 years or so, have they really started to look at meditation and, and study it. And originally the studies were, does meditation work or doesn't it? Now the studies are so finely teased out that they can do a study to note the benefits of meditation on women who are five foot nine with blonde hair in their middle age, whatever. I mean, they have teased it out so far that they can just show so many benefits of meditation. A lot of people use it for stress management. And bottom line, it really is a way to quiet the mind and the body. It's not a religion. However, a lot of religious and spiritual practices do use meditation or what they might call reflection. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it might not be considered meditation, but it is widely used in various forms. Um, it's not meant for only the chosen few. You don't have to be part of a religious or spiritual tradition to meditate. 
and it's not impossible. I tell people all the time, if I can meditate, anybody can, because my kids often joke with me that I have the attention span of a fruit fly and the ability to focus of a squirrel. So if I can sit down and meditate, I think anybody can. So when we think about meditation and, and the benefits that it holds for patients who are dealing with a cancer diagnosis, we tend to look at things from an evidence-based perspective. So what you see on this screen here, on this slide, is a grading scale, A through I. And yes, there are a couple letters that are missing, but basically, in essence, I know I'm not an educator, but there are a couple letters missing. However, um, what we're looking for when we're looking for a modality that works is something that rates an A, B, C, or perhaps even an I. Um, so A is really like this is a, a, an awesome modality for what you're using it for. B is this is a pretty darn good modality. C is kind of like, yeah, it, it could be good or it could be benign. And then I is that they just haven't studied it enough or there's just not enough information to really determine uh, the, the amount of benefit brought on by a certain modality. So when we look at meditation, meditation actually ranks quite high on the list um, as far as its grades. Anxiety and stress is an A. Mood disturbance and depression is an A. Quality of life whoops, is an A. Uh, fatigue is a B. And chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting uh, ranks a C, but that's all right because it's still a good modality. And the interesting thing is when the study was, or when the grading scale was originally um, put out regarding meditation, meditation as it pertained to helping pain rated an I, which meant there really wasn't sufficient uh, information or research done to determine the benefits for it. However, uh, I have read some recent studies that have shown that it kind of is between an A and a B. Because what it does, it doesn't necessarily uh, remove pain, but what it does is it changes the thought process. So that way your focus isn't on the pain. And there have been several individuals who've come to class experiencing quite a bit of pain, but for that 20, 40, 50 minutes that they're in class or that they're in the meditation, they're actually able to step away. From their pain. And to me, that's huge because it gives them a break from something that they're dealing with on a constant basis. So a lot of um, components uh, of the cancer experience can benefit from meditation. And really, when we think of this, we think of it in regards to the fact that when we are looking at our mind or looking at our um, uh, mindset, I guess is what we wanna look at. When we're dealing with a cancer diagnosis, that tends to be the focus and rightfully so. But in that moment or those moments of meditation, people can actually really be present in the moment, which is something that is difficult to do. It's difficult to do even if you don't have a diagnosis of cancer or you're not going through treatment. You know, if you think about, you could live in the most perfect world and sometimes you can get a little off your center. Meditation can help you bring, help bring you back to that moment in time where you are fully present. It allows you to alter how your mind thinks. When we're dealing with a cancer diagnosis or we're, we're undergoing treatment, a lot of times we don't feel good in our mind or in our body. And meditation can help us with that, if even for a little while. And then again, you know, 
and it's not just for individuals who are going through treatment or who have received a diagnosis, but it can be wonderful for caregivers or loved ones to also. There are uh, people that come to meditation class who come with their spouse or who come with their aide, who come with their parent or their child or their grandchild. And it really is a unique bonding experience and it allows them to kind of strengthen that bond on that level. So just some other benefits of meditation. And I'm sure, you know, if you've ever meditated, you might be able to add to this list, but these are just the things that come to mind right out of the gate. Um, you know, obviously, like I stated earlier, meditation is a wonderful tool to quiet the body and the mind, which is hard to do sometimes. And when you're dealing with a diagnosis or you're undergoing treatment or you're experiencing those symptoms, the mind is in constant motion. It feels like 35 hours a day, 12 days a week, right? Whether it's daytime, nighttime, whether you're doing something you enjoy or whether you're just sitting by yourself, um, the mind is always going and it can kind of take you down a rabbit hole sometimes or take you down into that rumination that nobody really wants to experience. Uh, meditation can help relieve stress and anxiety because once you quiet the mind, you're actually able to calm the body, which is a wonderful combination. A lot of people don't realize that what goes on in the mind actually manifests in the body. So meditation also has a wonderful ability to increase your energy if you're feeling sluggish or to calm you down if you're feeling a little hyped up. And when it calms you down, as a result of that, your blood pressure and your heart rate lower, your sleep improves, you feel better, you're not always on edge, and it promotes healing. And I wanna make it clear that healing is different than curing, right? When we talk about curing something, we're talking about getting rid of it, taking it away, being done with it. Healing allows you to kind of step back look at different aspects of your life and, and make things right. That's really what healing is about, an opportunity to make things right, whether it's a relationship, it's a thought, it's a process, it's a virtue, it's a whatever. You can promote that healing through meditation. So how does meditation impact the body and the mind? I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fight or flight response. Um, if nothing else other than I'm sure everybody's heard the example of, you know, cavemen, when they encountered a saber toothed tiger, you either fought the tiger or you ran like the Dickens away from it, right? And back then, that was a great response because when you are in your flight mode or your fight mode, you're adrenaline raises, all your bodily systems change, and you're ready to go. Once the threat was gone, then all of that system came back down to baseline. Unfortunately for us now in the world, we tend to vibrate at that level all the time, right? We experience one thing, we enter fight or flight mode. We start to decrease, something else happens. We're back into fight or flight mode. We have a little break, we're back in it again. So we never fully decompress from that, that fight or flight mode, which is not good for the body. It tends to uh, release those stress hormones, the cortisol, the adrenaline, all of that. And that's not a good thing. So what meditation does is it regulates what's called the sympathetic nervous system. And if I just get a little nursey on you for a minute, I'm not sure if people are familiar, in the body, you have what's called this autonomic nervous system. So it's composed of two parts. The one side is your sympathetic nervous system, that's your fight or flight mode. The other is the parasympathetic 
nervous system. That's what we call your rest and digest mode. That's what we want to do. That's where we want to be. Probably, I'm trying to think, when I say recently, I mean recently in the last, I don't know, 100 years, 50 years, they've discovered that in the brain, there's a new part called the executive center. And meditation actually enhances the executive center. So if you've ever seen the commercial, um, you're not yourself when you're hungry, I think it's for a Snickers bar, you know, and they're all like, ah, and then they have the Snickers bar and they're like, oh, that's kind of what the executive center does. Because what happens when we're in fight or flight mode, we tend to uh, reach out, so to speak, to the fear center of our brain. And the fear center vibrates up here. When you are in fear center mode, you are not yourself. So your executive center, once that's activated through meditation, is kind of like that cool, calm, and collected individual. So you've got the fear center on the ledge, two feet on the banana peel, vibrating like it's sponsored, and the executive center down below saying, you know what? It's okay. I got it. I can take it from here. And then the fear center can actually calm down. So when we talk about meditation, people tend to have some really basic questions, like the who, what, where, when, why, and how kind of questions. So the who is obvious, it's you. The, I had to think, what, when, where, and how, I'll answer in the next question, or in the next couple of slides. And the why is obviously to bring you to a better state of, bo of body and mind. So if you start to cultivate a mindfulness meditation practice, what you want to do first and foremost is start with a day and or a time of day that works for you. If you are an early bird, which I am, don't try to meditate at 11 o'clock at night because meditation at 11 o'clock equals sleep. And then you wake up the next morning like, wow, did I finish that meditation? Most likely not. And again, if you're an evening bird, a night owl, you don't want to try to meditate at five in the morning. Same thing. So pick a time of day that works for you and stick with it. You might have to play with it a little bit to kind of find what works best for you. Like well, maybe five o'clock isn't good, but six o'clock is. Or maybe 10 o'clock isn't good, but eight o'clock is. And you don't need to really spend a lot of time. I often share the story about how I was doing a um, presentation or a lecture at a conference and we were sitting at lunch and this gentleman sat down next to me and said, oh, so you meditate? And I said, yes. And he said, so do I, 15 hours a day. And immediately my brain was like, 15 hours a day, like, do you work? Do you have bed sores? Do you get up to eat? Do you breathe fresh air? Like, what are you doing for 15 hours a day? You can take three deep breaths in 15 seconds and get a better result than just, you know, I, I think what we're going for here is quality, not quantity. You want to find a location that works for you. If you can set up a little spot, you know, if, if I always laugh, I used to have a meditation room. It was beautiful. I had all my stuff and then I had kids and they needed a place to sleep. And there went my meditation room. So now I'm down to a meditation spot, but it doesn't matter because what you're trying to cultivate is, is similar to muscle memory. So I have a special um, meditation cushion that I use. And every time I sit on that cushion, it's like all of a sudden something triggers in me like, oh, it's time to meditate. And so I do. So that starts to immediately set you up for success. So finding that place, whether you're outside, you're inside, you have a room, you have a chair, 
if you have to go into your bedroom or the bathroom and lock the door for 10 minutes, then that's what you do and make that your spot. You want to start out slow. Um, you know, like I said, it doesn't need to be hours and hours. It doesn't need to be 20 minutes. It can be five minutes and you can achieve wonderful results from that. And be patient because there will be days where you can sit down and you can nail a 15 minute meditation and be so focused and so clear and so uninterrupted. And then there's other days where if you were sponsored or you had all the money in the world, you couldn't hold your focus for 30 seconds. That's why we call it a practice, right? We've been there before. <laughs> so remember, if if it's not working for you, bag it for the time being, right? And come back to it, either at a different time during that day or start the next day. This, this is something that is yours. And keep in mind too, if you've never meditated before, you can visualize um, a couple different things. Like I always use the analogy of herding wild cats. And if anybody in the group has ever had a cat, you know, sometimes they can be very affectionate. I mean, we have two, they have to be up in my skin all the time, you know, but then some cats, you bring out the carrier, they know exactly what that means and they're gone. Then you have to find them. Then you try to stick them in the carrier. The arms and legs are sticking straight out. They're fighting you all the way. You finally get them in the carrier. You get them to the vet. You try to get them out of the carrier. Now the arms are back out. They don't want to come out. It's a similar concept with your mind, right? Or you can visualize it like uh, a child who's never had boundaries before. And all of a sudden you find them, they're 15, 16 years old. They've had unlimited use of their cell phone. They've had no bedtime. And now you say to them, okay, you can use your cell phone one hour every day and bedtime is at eight o'clock. What do you think is going to happen? Other than the roof blowing off the house, probably. It's not going to go over well. And that's similar to how our mind is, but it's like any muscle in the body. You have to train it. You have to work it. You have to be patient with it. The other thing, too, is you can do meditation that might not even look like meditation. And we call this mindfulness. So it's being fully present for whatever you're doing. If you're walking the dog, fully walk the dog. Pay attention to the smells and the sights and, and all of that around you. Pay attention to your feet in your shoes or on the, on the grass or wherever you're walking. Same thing with perhaps washing dishes or doing laundry. Really immerse yourself in the experience and that's considered meditation as well when i was first learning how to meditate my mind was all over the place and i said to my teacher i i, I can't do this i i don't know how to do this this isn't working i can't get my mind to shut up and she said liz sit still and be quiet and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. Of all the things in the world that someone could ask me to do, sit still and be quiet, two things that are not on my specialty list. But when you sit still and you be quiet, people are laughing because they know me. Um, when you sit still and be quiet, something magical actually starts to happen in the body. If it's hard to keep your focus, focus on your breath. It's perfectly natural to sit down and close your eyes and immediately launch into your to-do list. All right, I've got to do this. I've got to mow the grass. I've got to clean the house. I've got to do da 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 You run through the list. The key is to bring the focus back. Where we, where we run into an issue is when you start to run through that list and next thing you know, you're eons away from the present moment. That's the problem. If you're able to bring the focus back, it's okay. It's perfectly natural for our minds to wander. 
Uh, the beautiful thing about meditation, it's not like any other sport or activity. You don't need a club. You don't need a racket. You don't need special shoes. You don't need candles. You don't need music. You don't need anything. If you want to burn a candle or you want to play music or you want to read um, something inspirational to give you a point of focus, you can do that. There's a lot of books out there now, you know, um, that have daily uh, things that you can read, whether they are uh, religious or spiritual in nature, or perhaps uh, maybe some inspirational poetry, um, some motivational quotes, anything like that you can read and then hold that thought in your mind as you move into your meditation. Which then meditation leads me to breathing. And I'd be a little, um, I wouldn't be doing it justice if I didn't at least touch on the breath. Because breath is so important. You know, a lot of people think about breath and they're like, I breathe whether or not I'm thinking about it. And that's true. That's true. Breathing is one of those involuntary bodily functions. But as it pertains to meditation or as it pertains to uh, relaxation, breathing is the most powerful tool in your toolbox. I can't say enough about it because what it does is it gives you A, oxygen to sustain your life, B, it can energize you, or it can relax you, depending on how you breathe. So we'll do a little bit of that breathing um, later at the end of the slideshow. So I just want to talk about one study. Like I said, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of studies that are being done now. A lot of them are done over in Sweden. Many are done in Germany. And some are done here uh, at some of our leading schools for um, at, up at Harvard. Yale, out in New Mexico, University of New Mexico. A lot of those schools are uh, leading studies on meditation. But this study in particular looked at the benefits of um, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is meditation, on patients that had cancer. And it was interesting because what they did was they brought a group of people in once a week and they had them take part in a meditation that lasted about 20 to 25 minutes. And then they would send them home and have, that do, have them do that meditation every day until they came back the following week. And it was amazing. They did this for eight weeks and the results were unbelievable. They found that people had all these uh, experiences here listed on the slide. They were more calm, they had better sleep, they had enhanced energy, less pain, they felt better overall, you know? And stress and anxiety seem to be the leading culprits for everybody in our society. I mean, and if you don't have stress and anxiety, all you need to do is read the paper or watch the first two news stories on the six o'clock news and that'll just be enough to jumpstart you. And we don't need that in our lives. So I love this slide. If anybody has ever seen, again, another commercial, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Well, on the left side, this is your brain when you're stressed. Notice all of the red, I don't know if you guys, yeah, the red area and the orange and the yellow, all of that area is stress in the brain. But after 10 minutes of meditation, that's what your brain looks like on the right. A little bit of green and a whole lot of blue. That's why blue is such a soothing color. Um, so it's really interesting that meditation can have that much of an impact just after 10 minutes. And it doesn't matter what meditation or what type of meditation you do. There's all different kinds of meditation. You have your basic breathing meditation where that's what you do. You focus on the breath. You have progressive muscle relaxation where you work your way down through the body 
relaxing every part. There's guided visualization, which tends to be everyone's favorite, uh, gives you a place to go. In some of the meditation classes I teach, they'll say, okay, Liz, where are we going this week? We're just going to jump in the van and off we go. Um, so lately we've done some really interesting ones. We've gone on a hang gliding ride. We've um, uh, gone on a magic carpet ride. We've done hot air balloon rides. We've ridden in trains. We've uh, done ju just gone to a lot of different places, ranches in Montana, hot tubs in the winter time, just all different things to give you a break. So I don't know if anyone has any questions right now. Um, if so, I'll answer the questions and then I'd like to take you through an experiential uh, practice where we'll do a little bit of breathing and then a guided meditation. Everybody's good? Oops, let me get back there. All right. So um, if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat box. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. So I want to start first with the breath. And what I want to invite you to do, first of all, is just take a moment and, and feel free to close your eyes if that feels good to you. If not, you can simply soften your gaze. And I want you to take a few breaths and just observe. I don't want you to control your breath. I don't want you to manipulate it. I just want you to observe. So chances are, if you weren't controlling your breath, you probably breathe way up here at the top part of your lungs. And that's totally natural. People just get enough air in there to just like keep the lights on. What we want to do is invite that breath to go down a little deeper. And we wanna do that for several reasons. One, when we take a deeper breath, and, and I realize when I say deeper, a lot of people might not be able to take a deep breath, but you can take a slow and easy breath, pulling that air in. When you do that, you send oxygen to every organ and every cell in the body. And it almost becomes like a celebration, like that air comes in and the cells are like, oh, the air has arrived and everybody's happy. The other thing it does is the deeper the breath, the calmer the mind and the body. And I'll talk about that again in just a second. But also as you take those deeper breaths, you engage your diaphragm, which sits right beneath the lungs. When you do that, you actually create that pump, so to speak, for the lymphatic system. In our bodies, our cardiovascular system has the heart that acts as the pump. The lymphatic system doesn't have a pump. So breathing and movement engage the lymphatic system. So when we do that, it's like jump-starting the garbage collection right? Because that's what lymphatic fluid does. It moves through the body, picks up toxins, infections, and germs, and rids them from the body. So when you take those deeper breaths or those longer breaths, you're inviting that lymphatic fluid to do its job. So when we talk also about um, the effect that it has on the body, when you're breathing, if you have a longer inhale, then exhale, you energize the body. When your exhale is longer than your inhale, you relax the body. So I'm going to invite you to just, we're going to do what's called a four square breath. So this will kind of level everything out. I invite you to take an inhale for a count of four. 
hold the breath for a count of four. Exhale for four. Hold for four. And again, inhale, two, three, four. Hold the breath, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Hold again, two, three, four. One more inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Hold the breath, two, three, four. And then go ahead and return your breathing to normal. And see if you notice any change in the body, any change in the thoughts that are going on in your mind. There are lots of different breaths that you can do. You know, just even simple breaths by placing one hand on the belly, one hand on the chest, breathing in. The hand on the chest will rise and fall, but our goal is to move that hand on the belly. So go ahead and take a couple of those breaths, just gently and release. And inhale. And exhale. And one more time in and out. Good. Any questions on the breath at all? There are so many different breathing techniques, and I think. It's gotten to be like pretty much everything else out there. You know, um, one person will take part in a breathing technique and then they'll put their own little spin on it and it becomes their breathing technique. Or, you know, they take a yoga class, they put a little different spin on it and then it becomes Liz yoga or Sheen yoga, you know, and that's how we end up with so many different types of yoga, but it's still yoga. So now what I'd like to invite you to do is settle back into a comfortable position. I'd like to take you just through a short meditation, a guided visualization. And for, I know there's a couple of people on here that come to class, um, so it'll be a repeat for you, um, but I think it's probably one that you'll like. So, um, if you've never meditated before, this is what I'm going to tell you. This is kind of my little 30-second um, spiel on meditation. Don't have any expectations. You know, you, you experience what you experience. Um, you know, don't be frustrated. Don't give up. But if at any point you feel uncomfortable, feel free to come out of the meditation, and that's perfectly fine. If your mind begins to wander, which chances are it will, I invite you to just bring your focus either back to your breath or back to the sound of my voice. So go ahead and settle into a pose or a position, whatever you want to call it, that feels most comfortable. The more support you can have beneath and behind your body, the better. So you don't have to worry about, oh, will I fall forward? So if you lean against the back of the chair or the couch or the wall. And I invite you to close your eyes. And if closing them doesn't feel comfortable to you, again, 
soften your gaze, allow your eyelids to lower, and your vision to kind of go out of focus. And I always like to begin with a few slow and easy breaths. So go ahead and take a few of those at your own pace. Just being mindful to slow them down, deepen them if you can, and allow each breath to be slower than the previous one. So the meditation I'll take you through tonight is watching summer clouds. So you're going to see yourself gazing up at the clouds in the sky. So again, bring your awareness to your breath. Notice each breath as it goes in and out of the body. And as you become aware of and begin to focus on the breathing, don't try to change anything. Just notice and breathe. We're going to slow that breath down just a little. Breathing in for a count of four. Holding for a count of three. And exhaling for a count of five. So go ahead and breathe in. Two, three, four. Pause, two, three, breathe out, two, three, four, five. Again, inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, exhale, two, three, four, five, one more time, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, exhale, two, three, four, five. And go ahead to continue breathing slowly and smoothly, relaxing more with each breath. And as you deepen your sense of relaxation, begin to create an image in your mind and see yourself lying on a blanket outside on a warm summer day. The blanket is in the soft grass next to some trees. The sun shines down warmly and a cool breeze blows against your skin. Just take that in for a few moments. And then see yourself looking up at the sky above, noticing the bright blue, beautiful sky and the clouds that are floating by, gently blowing on the breeze. 
take a moment to really experience all of the details of the scene. The feel of the sun and the breeze on your skin, the soft grass and the blanket beneath you, the trees beside you, and perhaps flowers or animals or birds. The leaves on the trees wave and turn as they gently move in the breeze. And amongst the trees are old trees and young trees. And you're able to see the clouds passing between their branches, drifting by. I invite you now to notice the different shapes of the clouds. Perhaps some are round, fluffy, cumulus clouds. Others are long, thin, wispy clouds, like streaks of semi-transparent white paint across the blue of the sky. The clouds drift lazily by, slowly, smoothly, simply floating. Go ahead and watch the clouds drift by overhead. As you do this, you feel the sun shining down, warming and relaxing you, creating a calm, sleepy feeling. And the breeze keeps you cool and comfortable. Your body deepens its sense of relaxation as you sink into the soft blanket and the grass beneath you. You feel your muscles relaxing, letting go. Allow your breathing slow down even more as you rest peacefully. As you look at the clouds, see what other shapes or designs you notice. Continue to take in the sights and sounds of this scenery, the sound of the wind in the trees, birds, singing, the leaves moving on the breeze, and the sun shining down on your face. Take a few more moments to experience this peaceful relaxation as you gaze up at the sky, watching the clouds.
I invite you now to slowly begin to return your awareness to the present moment. And with your eyes still closed, take a nice, slow, and easy breath in. And let it go. And in again. And out. And as you continue to breathe, allow your body to slowly reawaken, feeling the energy move through your muscles. If you like, you can go ahead and raise your shoulders as you breathe in and lower them as you breathe out. Keep with you this feeling of calm relaxation as you slowly return to a state of wakefulness. And when you're ready, you can emerge from the meditation simply by opening your eyes. All right, well, I would invite you um, to, you know, feel free to join uh, Monday night, Wednesday night um, at five or talk to Sydney or Dr. Houston or Dr. Ling about setting up one-on-one um, -on -one sessions. We can do a couple of those if you're not comfortable doing um, the group thing. Um, several people that have joined since uh, the pandemic hit started in one-on-one -on -one sessions and ended up joining the group. So it's a great place to find um, support, upliftment, encouragement. It's a great place to feel comfortable, um, you know, because everybody's been through the same thing. Maybe not the same thing, but everybody can appreciate the experience, you know. So it's a great, great opportunity, a great environment.